Hi there, good afternoon. Welcome to Café Weltschmerz. Today my guest is Professor Mark Blight and we're going to talk about populism and the economy. Good afternoon. Today my guest is Professor Mark Blight, a professor of political economy at Brown University in the United States. He's the author of the book Austerity, the History of a Bad ID. Mark, we're very happy to have you on the show. Nice to be here. I'm speaking from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. You're on the east coast of the United States, but we, yeah. can, we can hear each other pretty well. I'll give some background for our viewers uh, to introduce you. Uh, you're originally from Scotland. And you've yes. lived and worked in the United States for, uh, for the past years. And you're an outspoken commentator on current events, among which uh, populism, the economy, etc., etc. Would you like to say, like, uh, like introduce yourself a little bit? As in, what is your, what is your specialty? Uh, my specialty is debunking common sense, which really is nothing more than class prejudice disguised as common sense. Okay. And this... Common sense is not so common sense as we well, it would expect. It's very common, but it's usually in someone's interest rather than being a representation of the thing itself. Ah, okay, so you're debunking myths, basically. Exactly. Policy Mythbuster. Myths. How about Mythbuster? Excellent. Okay, let's start. Let's start with the uh, the interesting subject. You uh, wrote an article in Foreign Affairs several years years ago in which you. Uh, framed populism as global Trumpism. You said it's yes. it's actually global Trumpism. Could you like enlarge on that a bit? What is what is pop? Where does populism come from, and why do you call it global Trumpism? So, if your viewers want to go on the internet and Google global Trumpism, they'll see a talk that's got about half a million views. Mm -hmm. Where in July of 2016, I said Trump was going to win. Yeah, this yeah. and everyone in the room laughed. And I was right. Now, why was I right? Because my story goes something like this. This has been 30 years in the making. Mm -hmm. So you've yes. had a situation whereby, at least since the 1980s, the relationship between productivity and wages has broken down. So that basically means that people up to around the 60th percentile right across the OECD are not getting wage increases. That means that they're not earning more at a time when prices are going up. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the elites are telling them, no, prices aren't going up, inflation's falling. And it's true because you measure inflation very broadly. And inflation doesn't mean one price, whether it's health care or housing or education. It's a broad rise in the general index of prices. And that mm -hmm. hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. But if you live in the US, try telling people that education costs haven't gone up and health care hasn't gone up and they'll think you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. So the real costs that people face continue to go up. So how did we fill in that gap when wages aren't growing? We gave them lots of credit. The Netherlands knows about this. You're one of the most indebted societies in the world. Which you have a giant yeah. banking system that intermediates lots and lots of dodgy FDI money from all mm -hmm. over the place. Mm -hmm. You're essentially a giant version of the Cayman Islands, but we'll put that to one side just now. So we financialize the world and give everyone personal deficits. And we keep encouraging them to borrow more because interest rates keep falling. And then in 2008, that whole system had a heart attack. We then bailed out the asset holders in that system and stuck the costs of that in the form of austerity on the same 60% that haven't had a wage increase for about the previous 15 to 20 years. Mm. We then give them 10 years of austerity and moral lectures from mm -hmm. the Dutch and the Germans telling us how we all need to tighten our belts mm -hmm. when in actual fact what happened was just a disguised bailout of your bank's risky lending decisions. Mm -hmm. And eventually when people get, get fed up being mansplained by the same elites that told them everything was fine and then the world blew up and the world, everything's great and we need to stay in the EU and everything's great and we're celebrating Obama's legacy. And it turns out a lot of people don't believe that. Hmm. So when you give them an opportunity to tell them to get lost, like Brexit as an EU referendum that wasn't really about the EU, or to vote for someone like Trump because he's so against the views of the establishment, then it turns out millions of people will take that chance. Yeah. So this is all perfectly explainable, basically, is what you're saying. And so, so we, we should see these votes as a kick in the teeth for the elites, basically, or for elite uh, thinking in general. Yes, because let's think about what elites got wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So go back to Iraq that was going to bring democracy to the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's cost three trillion so far and hasn't mm -hmm. worked. 
Another three trillion in Afghanistan, the war without end. Mm -hmm. We had the whole thing about the great moderation in finance and how central banks knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Then we had a giant bust, which cost 17 trillion in central bank interventions. And all the costs of that have been put on the people who have the least assets. Mm -hmm. So it's really perfectly straightforward. Ah. And so, well, you mentioned the Netherlands, as in the situation in the Netherlands, is, it's, a, it's a fairly rich country by, uh, if you look at the common standards being used for yeah. rich or poor. On the oh, other hand, there is, there is an enormous amount of what you say, like private debt, not as much public debt, but private debt, people borrowing to buy houses, people borrowing credit, etc. And do you think that in the Netherlands all this is cushioned by the fact that people don't really understand that they're exposed? Yes, I think that's true everywhere. Okay. So we're taught to worry about public debt. Public mm -hmm. debt is the most terrible thing we can possibly have. But the funny thing is, countries seldom die. Mm -hmm. Even Greece doesn't die. It's been around for a very long time. <laughs> Argentina can default five times in a hundred years and people still buy their bonds. Mm -hmm. They have the intragenerational capacity to pay for their debt through mm -hmm. taxation. Mm -hmm. Households don't. Yeah. So I like to put it this way. I'm a brilliant credit risk because I'm an Ivy League professor. Mm -hmm. I've got a very secure job and a reasonable income. I will die within the next 50 years. That is inevitable. The United States will not. Whose debt would you rather hold? <laughs> and yet we're taught to fear public debt and celebrate private debt when it's private debt that stresses us out and causes our politics to fracture. I think in your book, uh, Austerity, the History of a Bad Idea, you mentioned that there was an obsession with this public debt, as in, uh, and this is particularly, you, you say, uh, a, a Germanic obsession, that public it debt is. is bad. I would also throw the Dutch in there because, of course, you Thank know, you, very you two are all Protestants. <laughs> and I don't know if you have the same root in Dutch, but the German word for uh, debt is the same as the word for guilt. It's, it, it, it's exactly the same word in Dutch as well, and it has both meanings. And I most... think that tells us all we really need to know. Okay. So basically, being in debt is shameful, but being a creditor is a wonderful mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, to be a creditor, somebody else has to be the debtor, because it all sums to zero. Yeah. So what you guys wish for is a world where everybody borrows from you, but you bear no moral responsibility or financial responsibility for the decisions to lend. Mm -hmm. So what happened in the case of Greece was that Greece got credits, probably overcredited, but you say that uh, both actors are equally guilty. If you yes. give lots of money to a friend who you know has no money and he's going to spend it on alcohol and whatever, then you end up in this situation, basically. Well, they don't spend it on alcohol. They or, spent it on modernizing the subway. Well, this is what Jeroen Dijsselbloem said to the uh, southern countries, oh, that he spent it on snuff and No, no, no. That yeah. was absolutely outrageous. Okay. They spent it all in drinking women. Really, I'd like to see the empirical evidence for that. Because I know if I go to the European Commission and look at their country reports on Greece mm. during the 2000s, they were giving double thumbs up for all the good public investment they were doing. So a yeah. little bit of hypocrisy from decent bloom there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so if we, could, if we look a little bit at the current political and economic situation in Europe, we have Mario Draghi, the uh, still president of the Central Bank, who is still... Uh, going further with quantitative, what it's called quantitative easing, eh? basically yes. money printing, if you want to put it in like yes, in, in average. Absolutely. Yeah, that's and what it is. Is this right. a good idea? Well, you're money printing, why? Because you're trying to boost asset prices. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. are you trying to boost asset prices? Because you hope that the people who then have inflated assets feel rich and spend a bit more money. Mm -hmm. So your entire economic stimulus strategy is to expend more credit into a place that just blew up 10 mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. because it extended too much credit. Yeah. It doesn't sound too sensible, does it? No. Now, here's the real question. Why is it that Europe has absolutely no fiscal policy? Mm -hmm. Why is everything laid at the feet of Mario Draghi? Why is Mario Draghi's decision to spend or not spend the most important thing in Europe? Mm -hmm. Countries have treasuries. Countries have tax bases. Countries can afford to invest over the long term. Currently, pretty much all European debt over a long period of time is negatively yielding, mm -hmm. which basically means you're selling debt and people are paying you to borrow the money. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely no reason for the governments of Europe to sit around waiting for Mario Draghi to do anything. Yeah. They could be funding a green transition, they mm -hmm. could be raising mm -hmm. taxes, they could be redistributing, but they choose not to. Mm -hmm. Instead, we have a conversation about Mario. That's the bullshit move. Mm -hmm. And why do you think this is this is well, why do you think this is happening this way? Because the way that the euro was designed was designed for a world that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. What where demand and supply meet at what's called the equilibrium interest rate, which mm -hmm. can be targeted by the central bank, and everyone can sit back behind a series of rules and sit back and watch growth. 
Well, that hasn't worked. Your growth rates are half of what the U.S. is. Your mm-hmm. unemployment is double what the U.S. is. Mm-hmm. There's been a crisis that was twice as deep as the U.S. in the South, and you haven't solved any of those problems. And instead, it's like, what can the central bank do now? Well, the central bank can do one thing. It can raise them, two things. It can raise and lower the price of money, the mm-hmm. interest rate, which is already negative for deposits, mm-hmm. or it can re- buy and sell assets to make people feel wealthier and hope they spend a bit more. Mm-hmm. It can also do tiered interest rates, TLTROs, which are targeted lending, but it's all basically trying to get people who have already got too much debt to spend more money by taking on more debt. Yeah, it's not a good system. And uh, basically, isn't it? Wouldn't it be a better idea to actually give m- people money in their pockets, as in money to spend, instead of if, creating if all these bubbles? Which... That's your only option on the monetary side. But a far better idea would be to rediscover fiscal policy, which mm-hmm. is exactly what Mario Draghi said in his last press conference mm-hmm. and in his previous 15 press conferences. You have governments in the north, like the Netherlands and mm. uh, Germany, who are priding themselves on the Schwarze Null. We will neither borrow yep. nor spend. Yep. And you've got the locks falling off the Kiel Canal. Mm. Your infrastructure is falling apart. Yep. And no, no, we'll just keep paying back the debt. Let's remember this one. Yep. The public debt is the private sector's savings. Mm-hmm. That's literally what they are. Mm-hmm. So it's a good idea to destroy public sector savings and not invest. That's basically what we're saying. Mm-hmm. What uh, Angela Merkel has said in the midst of the crisis was that, what was that the um, the values of the Swabian housewife would will be what was her inspiration for economic policy. So that's, basically, that's great. The next time I need a doctor, then I'll probably try and ask my cat, because that would be my inspiration <laughs> equivalent for a Swabian housewife. Yeah, so a, ho- a private household is not equitable to uh, public finance, basically, is what you mean. No, you can't because compare the two. I don't get to bring people into my household and tax them for five generations. I don't get to issue my own money. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to hold Mark Blythe dollars for very long. Mm-hmm. And governments get to do that. The analogy to the housewife or the, um, the household is deliberate deliberate misleading nonsense mm-hmm. yeah but these are things that play well in german politics eh? they're schwarz and null as in we have yeah. like 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 no no we're not going into red and we're saving and we're, we're thrifty and yeah, we're doing our best all this and all works the well because transition is not happening mm-hmm. and your car industry is falling apart because you're still long diesel when everyone else is moving to electric mm-hmm. and yeah. you have to ask what the quest what the purpose of politics is Either the the purpose of politics is to tell people the truth, even if it's uncomfortable, and to lead them to a place that's better for them, a generation Mm -hmm. from now, or it is to win the next election by giving people bullshit, because that's what they're used to. That's and, what we're doing. Yeah, you you think that the German government and the Dutch government should just start spending on essential stuff like infrastructure, which you mentioned before, and this, this have, would be better. How about having a plan? How about actually having a plan as to what you're going to do with the fact that if you look even 15 years ahead, the effects of climate change in Europe are going to be catastrophic. Mm-hmm. There's already reports suggesting that European agriculture will be destabilized within 10 to 15 years because the, the glaciers that the rivers all depend on are themselves being destabilized. Mm-hmm. You're going to have more and more climate change refugees. You're going to have some degree of ideas to where you want to be in 15, 20 years time of what your economy looks like. Mm-hmm. Instead of which, no, no, we just want to spend, you just want us to spend money. Yes, I do, because you need to and you can afford to. And if you don't do it now, your children will hate you. Oh, and it will actually be beneficial if we spend money for it. Uh, in, 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 well, in, I'll put it this way. Pointlessly saving it hasn't done you much good, has it? Especially, especially with present interest rates, right? Um, exactly, because they're paying you to no. borrow the money. No. Why no. do you not do this? No. Oh, because interest rates might go up. Well, interest rates have been falling secularly since the 1300s. So mm-hmm. I really wouldn't go with that one. Yeah. So to quote your book again, you uh, you mentioned ordo liberalism as sort of a leading concept, specifically in Germany, but also within the Troika, the European, uh, the Eurogroup, etc. Can you explain what ordo liberalism means exactly? Well, you know whether this is still relevant now post the crisis. I did write the book a few years ago, mm-hmm. and basically the way that Germans think about macroeconomics is there's no macro, that there's no independence of mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. the big economy, consumption, investment from the individual decisions of firms. 
And in fact, the only thing that really matters is firms and the only thing that matters is to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And if you have competition in markets and you basically use the state to structure markets such that competition becomes the virtue and you have fiscal prudence and you don't spend too much and you don't get too much inflation, then you can kind of run the whole country as the metal stand and sell BMWs to everyone and make a pile of money. Uh, the only problem with that is it completely ignores the macro. That is, for somebody to buy your BMW, somebody else has to be running a deficit. Mm -hmm. And if you're not running a deficit, you're permanently running a surplus. Not only do you need the deficit countries you criticize so much, whether that's Greece or the United States, mm -hmm. you need something to back that in when you make all that money. And that stuff is the US dollar, yeah. which you then invest abroad and make losses on. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a system that's benefiting yourself. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned austerity a lot, as in austerity being the, the cure for all our ills that was uh, prescribed by the Troika and uh, the, the Eurogroup. Eh? Austerity yes. basically means cutting public, public expenditure, say, saving on the welfare state, and this would, in this way you would cut your way out of a recession. This was the, yes, the leading exactly. concept. All right, so I'm going to ask you a question. Please tell me how you cut your way out of a recession. Uh, well, we don't see much evidence of it happening, so... But just even the logic, right? You're a smart bloke, you've heard this argument before. You tell me how that works. Uh, I don't see it happen because um, it's like a negative spiral, basically. Like, you're, right. you're going right. further down, further down, and... If you think about it for more than two seconds, it's patent nonsense. Because it relies on an unequal put, that mm -hmm. is to say, we're all going to tighten our belts. Here's the problem. Some people are wearing really big trousers mm -hmm. and most of us aren't. Mm -hmm. So it's an asymmetric adjustment and it's yeah. an adjustment on the people that can afford it the least. You want to know why Brexit went mental? Think about the north of England. Mm -hmm. Those gov the local governments up there suffered the brunt of austerity. London suffered nothing. Yeah. And what that meant was people, areas like Preston mm -hmm. in the north of England lost 30% of their funding. So there's an absolute catastrophic loss of social services in areas which are heavily dependent on government spending. Yeah. So it's a double whammy. So guess what? These people now don't believe a word that centre parties say, and they're prime targets for Brexit voters. Well, so, is there, why is that a surprise? Yeah, so you're, cu you're cutting libraries in Liverpool and you're saving a few uh, pennies and you're not doing anything about structural problems, basically. Right, not doing that, but not just that. The argument was from George Osborne at the mm -hmm. time we could become Greece. In other words, if we don't cut libraries in Liverpool, then British bond yields will increase to the point that we become Italy. Mm -hmm. Well, British bond yields went down all the way through the crisis, irrespective of whether they're cutting or spending. Yeah. Because yeah. in financial crises, fi uh, in uh, investors want safe assets, government bonds are safe assets. Hmm. So the ultimate irony is, you're paying back and reducing the supply of safe assets that people mm -hmm. want when there's a crisis. Oh. This literally makes no sense. Oh. And we've seen uh, the aforementioned Troika and Eurogroup uh, implementing policies on Greece in which they said, OK, Greece is, first of all, they're culpable for, uh, for borrowing too much. And second of all, they have, to, they have to show to tighten their belts even more than we do. They have to sell off yes. their assets like their ports yes. to the Chinese and all that. And that yes. will at some point reinstigate uh, their, their proper uh, sense of duty and then they will start, then they will start growing again, eventually. Yeah, I, I never really thought that economics was a morality play. I think mm -hmm. it's very difficult to explain how moral virtue gets you there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we want to think about corruption scandals, it's not as if northern economies have been free of banks that are doing money laundering and politicians taking fistfuls of dollars and sticking in their back pockets. Mm -hmm. So Chirac died the other day, I believe there's national mourning, I believe he was implicated in quite a few scandals in his day. And uh, let's see, oh cool, Helmut Kohl, there's another one, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's think about uh, Schroeder, went off to become minister for Gazprom. Barroso, who used to run the commission, went off to work for Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. And we're pointing at the Greece for the moral failings. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is politics over economy, basically over it sound is basically economy. Basically, using a moral argument to hide the fact that what we really did with Greece was use it as a conduit to bail out German and French and Dutch banks. So we gave money to the Greeks, money. and they paid it back to those banks. It's public exactly. money. Going you owe the into... banks, so you have to pay it back. I don't have any money. I'll lend you the money from my taxpayers to pay the banks, but it's going to go through you, so you look like you're doing it. That's all that happened. Hmm. We had Jeroen Dijsselbloem, the former president of the Eurogroup, on this show, say, about a year ago. And he was asked the question, do you think the euro is in good shape? And he said the euro is in excellent shape and Greece, will, uh, Greece is already showing signs of improvement. So it's working. 
That well, was here's the thing. If you throw yourself out of a building and break both your legs and manage to crawl away on your elbows, I suppose that's a sign of improvement. It's progress. It's some sort of progress. It's some sort of progress. From a certain baseline. Level. Mm. I believe that their adult male unemployment rate is still in double figures and throughout the South around 30% of all people under 25 have uh, are unemployed. The problem with that is that means their lifetime's earnings have been destroyed because they're not learning skills and they're not moving up through the mm -hmm, labor market. Mm -hmm. The result of that basically means that Greece's ability to grow over the long run has been devastated by these policies. And of course, lots of people from Greece, Italy, Portugal and Spain move to Northern Europe and they get yes, jobs here. So we, the sort of like ex expertise is leaving that region. Right, and but so also the tax base. It's oh. perfect because what happens is you guys are shrinking. You've got an old population. Mm -hmm. So if you don't pay back your debt to GDP, this is the one argument of the Germans make that make sense, is we need to pay back our debt because we're shrinking as a population and we can't deal with immigrants. Mm -hmm. Well, you do have immigrants. What you do is you get immigrants from the south because there's no jobs there. No. And then they come in and pay the taxes for your pensioners. Eventually, of course, countries like Italy and Spain will suffer from this. And... You, we see already in Italy, we had Matteo Salvini in government, while well, he's, he's yeah. out of there again, but I mean, it's Italian politics. He's, it he's waiting lot. for his next chance. He's waiting for his next chance, and he's very popular. He, he went from 17% to 40% in the polls, while mm -hmm. he was Minister of the Interior, because he, met, he sort of curtailed immigrant, the immigrant yeah, flow to Italy. Absolutely. They now have a government which is more palatable to the, to the European Commission, with, uh, with Renzi's old party involved again, mm -hmm. and the Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement. Uh, but eventually, um, present policies continuing, you're going to see more discussions between countries like Italy and Spain and the European Commission, right, on how to handle their debt. Yeah, so how does, uh, how does that how play out? It. The debt isn't a problem so long as there isn't an interest rate spike, which there won't mm -hmm. be, yeah. or a crisis. And if yeah. there is a crisis, ironically, what happens is equities plummet and bonds rally. Mm -hmm. So if anything, they'll actually benefit from it because people would want to buy that debt because the ECB, thanks to Draghi, has given a guarantee that they will be the buyer of last resort. So the mm -hmm. debt is not the problem. The problem is long-term unemployment and low growth. Mm -hmm. Italy hasn't grown in over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That basically means that economy has shrunk in real terms mm -hmm. and they're getting older. Yeah. They have no growth model. They can't. Their pocket multinationals are the size of German SMEs mm -hmm. in the middle stand. They have no way of competing with the Chinese. They are small artisan manufacturers that run the show. 30 percent of the labor market works in micro enterprises of less than 15 people. Mm -hmm. Got absolutely decimated by the twin forces of the Europeanization and the euro and China coming together. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a growth model. Now, you, your politicians can play distraction and say, yeah, it's all immigrants, blah, blah, blah. And Italy has an immigrant problem because they're one of the number one destinations for desperate people fleeing Africa. Mm -hmm. And there are hundreds of thousands of them. This is a political issue. Yeah. But it's not going to solve their growth problem. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with the growth problem. The growth problem would be aided by a massive debt relief program or reprofiling, plus a huge amount of investment from the EIB mm -hmm. along the lines of either and or border security and green transition. Mm -hmm. Neither of which is going to happen because ultimately you just say to the Italians, you deal with it, we're not taking any immigrants. So the hypocrisy on top of it is astonishing. So maybe, perhaps, potentially, they will get Salvini back in another capacity. And your discussions that uh, Italy has with the uh, European Commission haven't gone as far as saying we'll leave the euro. But you think they that point that point will come? Leave the euro. It's the Hotel California. Once you check <laughs> in, you can't get out because if you leave, you'll destroy half a national savings, which okay. is also half of your national debt. So it mm -hmm. depends on whether you've got a real populace who's willing to risk that. Mm -hmm. But given that most national savings are concentrated in the top 20 percent of the population, and they're the ones that you have to care about when it comes to elections. Mm -hmm. It's a tough call yeah. because all the, imagine the following. Imagine Salvini plus comes to power mm -hmm. and he says, right, we're off. We're going to have a referendum on the euro. At that point, any Italian with euros in a euro deposit in Italy will open a bank account in Germany. You will have massive flight, capital flight in euros through the Target 2 system, the payment system of the central bank, mm -hmm. through to Germany. German yields already negative will go catastrophically negative. The Germans at that point have a choice. They either issue more debt, oh my God, they would never do that, to give the Italians something else to buy, or alternatively they put up capital controls thereby ending the euro. Any way that they do this, it's going to cause a massive crash in the ex anticipated new exchange rate of, Ita of the Italian currency mm -hmm. if they get a new one, and massive capital flight that would threaten the euro itself. Mm -hmm. So the very action of suggesting that you would leave could destroy half your savings. Yeah. So no one's going to do it. You're yeah. stuck. 
So you're stuck not because not just because the European Union wouldn't let you leave or the Eurogroup would try to you block can't. it, but you, you simply can't. No. Right. So the only solution is what you previously said, there needs to be some investment, there needs to be a growth model for the, say, the poorer yeah. regions in Europe, for the Spains and the Portugals and the Italy's. Yeah. And the it's United not going to happen. The United States in the 1930s through the 1960s rebuilt the south of the United States. The south of the United States was barely electrified at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's now the fastest growing region of the United States. Why? Because of capital markets triggered by early government investment, moving to places that are capital poor, that are labor rich, that you can actually invest in and turn a buck. Oh. You can't make any money in Germany. Everybody's old, nobody spends, and they save too much. Simply paying back the national debt isn't gonna do nothing on, to, to promote growth. Mm -hmm. This sounds like, like a new deal, a new deal for Europe. Uh, but you've also described in earlier articles and books that um, the whole, this whole thinking behind the new, that, that went behind the New Deal, like, and also like the Keynesian, Keynesian idea of spending, has been pretty much removed from the public debate by yes. a certain interest. Can you, can you explain how that happened? Well, we had the neoliberal revolution, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. coming out of the inflationary crisis of the 70s. A very simple way to think about this was the post-war growth model that made Europe rich, made everybody rich. Mm -hmm. The problem with making everybody rich is that the labor share of national income became very, very high and capital share, the returns to capital share became low. Mm -hmm. When you start to generate inflation in that system, because you're running super tight labor markets for years and years and years, mm -hmm then the only way the business can maintain profitability is by passing it on in prices. So you get the inflation of the period, wages and prices chasing each other up. What that means is the real rate of return for capital becomes negative because I invest for five years and expend 5%, inflation goes to 10%, why would I bother investing? Mm -hmm. So investment collapse, unemployment starts to go up, inflation starts to go up, and we reset the system. Mm -hmm. That was the Reagan and the Thatcher revolutions, that was the turn of the IMF and the mm -hmm. OECD a decade later. That's what brought you the Euro project mm -hmm. in its modern form with market integration, competition, etc. Mm -hmm. And above all, rules rather than fiscal policy. Yeah. So this made sense to fight a crisis that ended 30 years ago. It mm. makes absolutely no sense to pursue those policies in an environment in which there is zero inflation. In fact, mm. there's negative inflation, there's yeah. deflation, and you have negative real interest rates. Yeah, it's it's like, a bit like saying the last time I had a cough, I drank treacle and stuck my fingers in the electric socket, and two days later I was fine. Now I broke my leg. Let's try the same thing. It's a different problem. You might want to try something else. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like starving someone who's had no food in uh, in a week. As, yeah, give, and given them even recovery, less. you declare it a great success. Yeah, <laughs> as well. Yeah, and uh, so basically, what what you mentioned you mentioned in an article, big bang to big crash is what we have right now. So you inflate, you you create bubbles, and they end yes. up in a huge crash, and then you try and 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 sort of a restart a new bubble in the hope that this time it will, it will turn out right. So this is an article that's specifically about Britain, but it could be generalized to the Anglo economies, perhaps mm -hmm. the, the financialized Scandinavian and Dutch economies, mm -hmm. uh, but that's pretty much the limit. So the basic idea is you only get growth when you have asset bubbles. Yeah. So beginning in the 1980s, once you got rid of the inflation of the period, what, how do you grow? Well, you can massively expand your banking system. You can throw credit all over the place. And there's been a pent up demand for credit for years and inflation has given you negative returns. So people load up on credit. Well, governments also stopped building houses at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was the housing stock, suddenly you had mortgages and you had no more new supply. So the prices were going to go through the roof. And this is what happened in Holland, the United Kingdom, mm -hmm, the United mm -hmm, States. Mm -hmm. So that lack of public investment and the privatization of those public assets, along with mortgages, turns housing into an asset class. Well, that asset class gets overbid and periodically goes bang. And then mm -hmm. what does the government do? It basically rescues the housing market and mm -hmm. then puts it back together again. The banks are told to be a little more cautious and eventually mm -hmm. they stop being cautious and they reflate it and they do it again. And mm -hmm. you can do it on different asset classes, but housing is the most obvious one. Mm -hmm. And basically we drive a lot of the economic activity through useless bubbles rather than through real investment. Yeah. And you mentioned the Netherlands here, which many people who are viewing here in the Netherlands will recognize, because we had a housing market bubble pre-2008, which, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was seen as not a bubble, but as a natural development. That is what people in authority would be saying. Then you awesome. had an enormous crash, which was not supposed to happen. Then after, after say, five or six years, there was, another, there was another bubble, so house prices are going to the roof again. And again, we're being, we're, the, the official word from above is, this is not a bubble. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, Nothing why, to worry so about. So think about it this way. 
if I make an investment, let's say I want to invest in something that's a classically investment. I want to make an investment in Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm betting on the share price, which reflects the future earning growth of that company because mm -hmm. they make something the world wants to buy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If I'm just swapping houses, in which way is that investment? It's not. You're just betting on a capital gain because of restricted supply. Mm -hmm. And people want to live in certain areas. So this is not investment. This is pure speculation. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. definition of a bubble is speculation. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. not investment. This is not. This is just utter waste of time. It's a waste of time and and investable resources essentially. And several. I mean, many people in the Netherlands say, okay, so my cost of housing has already gone up. My savings are useless because they're not generating any interest rates. Uh, right. Pensions eventually are hurt because pensions in the Netherlands are private yeah. pension funds that make less. Profit right now because of Draghi's policy. So how do you how do you see that? Where well, will that end? Draghi's policies. It's important to remember this. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that central bank action has dragged down interest rates since the crisis. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that from their peak of around 16% in 1981, mm -hmm. they fell to 8%, then to 4%, mm -hmm. then to 2%. Yeah. They went back up to four and mm -hmm. then they went to zero and they've stayed there. Mm -hmm. If you there's a Bank of England research paper on this and a bunch of other stuff. You can draw a linear trend of declining rates pretty much from either the 13th century or the 15th yeah, yeah, century. Yeah, you mentioned this before. Yeah. Oh. Right. So basically, you know, the notion that you're going to get 4% real for showing up at the Sparkasa just because it's your God-given right, mm. governments have to tell the truth. That was a historical anomaly. It's not coming back. Now, ah. if you want to earn a return, then what do you do? Stop investing in bonds and invest in equities. Oh. You still have a 6% premium in equities. Yes, it's more risky, but you could basically build up a rainy day fund such mm -hmm. that if you were a group of retirees who basically retired when the stock market lost its value, you could look at what that total value you drop was mm -hmm. and use your rainy day fund to compensate mm -hmm. them because 93 percent of the time you'll be able to cash out with a profit mm -hmm. so for example the swedes tie their pensions to the stock market mm -hmm. they don't tie them with bonds mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so there's plenty of ways of thinking out of this and doing it it's just that politicians are tra trapped in this kind of rhetorical prism of negative rates of Draghi's fault. If we just get rid of Draghi, then we can all have profits again. Uh, we don't need to change diesel cars. Climate change is not somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. And this is all grotesquely irresponsible. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a democracy, you're meant to tell the truth and act in the interests of your public, mm -hmm. rather than basically take the easy option and lie so you can win the next election. It's a disgrace. Uh, you mentioned irresponsibility in relation to politicians. Let's talk about Brexit for uh, for a while again. Oh, that's uh, epic! Yes, this is it's a very interesting case study in political science, by the way. Brexit. So it's like evolving before our eyes. So we have Boris Johnson as prime minister. So we have the man who promised <coughs> who promised uh, green pastures in the future at the helm. Yeah. So he can also be held responsible now. Uh, you actually said that uh, Brexit is mostly the problem for mostly a problem for the Tories right now. It's theirs yeah. to solve because they caused it. Can you explain that a bit further? Well, that was true when I said that, and mm -hmm. of course the world changes. It's now mainly Labour's problem. So let okay. me explain both. Okay. So the Labour Party made an astute observation, mm -hmm. which is Brexit is created by the Tories, and if you play it right, it can destroy the Tories, because if you can. If you can cooperate with them mm -hmm. to the point that government grinds to a halt and eventually there is no solution to the Irish border question, right? Mm -hmm. Just think about it for two minutes. There's no solution, right? So you either have Ireland staying in the customs union or you don't. And if you do, you haven't left. So mm -hmm. it's not Brexit, right? So they've got a bomb strapped to their chest, the Conservatives, mm -hmm. called Brexit. Mm -hmm. And Corbyn's job was to let it go off. Mm -hmm. Now, that only works so long as you don't have a prime minister that wants a hard Brexit. Enter Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. Johnson mm -hmm. actually wants a hard Brexit. Yeah, he's willing to risk everything. I will never yeah. understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps because of his friends in the financial community trying to do the mother of all shorts. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, he seems to be able to accept that. The minute you do, Corbyn's strategy is wrong-footed because it now looks like he's been wasting time for two years and he doesn't have a clue what he's doing, mm -hmm. which is, seems to be the case. Mm -hmm. So Boris, despite causing this uh, unnecessary paralysis of the British state for two and a half years and causing what is likely to be an extremely painful financial and economic disruption to Britain over the next several years, mm -hmm. is probably going to win the next election. And in that case, there could be a, an experiment in populism, uh, which will be like 
governing a major European country. Yeah. And you would see like an experiment into, let's call it like jingoism, right-wing nationalism, see where that ends up. Absolutely. And so it can go one of two ways. It can simply hurt more than they expect their capacity because the quality of political capital is so astonishingly low. Mm. They're not able to manage it. You can wave bye bye to things like the car industry. Why mm. would they stay there? They can just move their production to France or Germany or the mm. Netherlands mm. where they're inside the single market. Mm. But then five years out, you've got the time zone advantage. Mm. It's the perfect place. You've still got the city of London, which is what these people really care about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You still have the pound. If it doesn't actually crash through parity, then it still mm -hmm. acts as a kind of quasi-reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And you've got an IT sector globally which speaks English, and you've mm -hmm. got a financial sector that speaks English. Mm -hmm. So you've suddenly got very cheap assets in a very cheap pound mm -hmm. that the rest of the world might want to buy. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're betting that if they get through three to five years, then things will restabilize. It's a, it's slightly better than decent bloom saying that after 10 years of catastrophe, Greece is growing again. Mm -hmm. But it's the same sort of narrative, and it's probably the best they can hope for. Mm. Yeah, and th is this feasible that that the that the UK will be like a, an 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 alternative to the European Union, sort of like existing side by side? Well, the weird thing about it is, and I've said this many times, Britain's leaving something it was never really a member of. Mm -hmm. Right, you're only really in the in the European Union if you're in the euro, and Britain yeah. wasn't in the euro. Yeah. So, you know, they're leaving for minutia, for mm -hmm. stuff that doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. If you were in the euro, fair enough, but you're not. Yeah. So 60% of British trade is still going to go to the countries of Europe. Doesn't matter whether you're in it or you're not in it. So this just makes no sense mm -hmm. in terms of looking at it that way. Mm -hmm. In terms of political strategy, in terms of um, just pure politics within the Conservative Party, Brexit makes sense. But it also makes sense in terms of uh, the British public being absolutely fed up of what their governing elites have been doing for the past 20 years. No. And I'll give you a story which uh, is my favourite story from Brexit, and I've said it many times, so forgive me if you've heard this before. But they went, the uh, Remain campaign went up to campaign to stay in the European Union. They went to Sunderland. Sunderland ended up voting, if I remember right, 61% to get out. It's a city in the northeast. Mm -hmm. And it has a Nissan car plant, which is the major employer, and 90% of the output goes to Europe. So they went up there and said, well, lads, obviously you're going to vote to Remain. And they started to get abuse from the floor. And one of the people stood up and said, you've got to realize that if you close this down and you vote to get out, there'll be a loss of GDP. And one of the car workers shouted out the smartest thing that anyone said that month, your GDP. Yeah. Because it might be going up for you in London, it might be going up for you shareholders, mm -hmm. but it's not going up for us. Our wages aren't going up, our contracts aren't getting any better. Mm -hmm. Sunderland's still Sunderland. We're not getting wealthy. So don't tell us it's all going well. Mm -hmm. That's the real problem. Is there, an, is there a realistic option that Jeremy Corbyn, should he become Prime Minister, could pursue something radically different? And, and then diffuse, diffuse yeah. right-wing populism by having a left-wing alternative? Yes, exactly. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is a left-wing populist, right? Mm -hmm. So what he did is he, he kind of did what Trump did before mm -hmm. Trump did. Trump basically did a leveraged buyout with no capital for the entire Republican Party because mm -hmm. mainstream Republicanism was no longer selling with their base. Ah. And Corbyn basically did the same thing with New Labour. As a project that was dead, he walked in, mm -hmm. he took it over, he built momentum, and, and the rest is there. The people around him have, in my opinion, some really smart ideas mm -hmm. about sovereign wealth funds becoming citizens' wealth funds, investing for the long term, investment for the green transition, all the stuff that is neither, mm -hmm. it's really not left wing nor right wing. Mm -hmm. It's about rebuilding public assets and not leaving everything to the private sector because mm -hmm. it all just gets skimmed off by the top 1%. I so think, let's yeah. do something different. I think now, you mentioned that these policies were generally widely acceptable in the 80s still. In yeah, Europe and even, He's yeah. about as left wing as the Swedish Social Democrats in 1982. Hmm. That's about how left wing he is, right? Let's renationalize the trains. Most of the trains in Europe are nationalized. This is hardly communism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the British elites and British press, who are very much biased towards the Conservative, have painted this guy as if he's Stalin. And the anti Semitism stuff and all the rest of it is a smear campaign. So it's high, and also the fact that Boris has now basically played this card which makes their strategy on Europe look stupid. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be Prime Minister. So we're going to end up with exactly those kind of right-wing jingoistic populist policies in the immediate after aftermath of Brexit, 
which means that British workers who have been taking real wage cuts for the past 10 years mm -hmm. are about to take at least another five years of the same. Well, let's turn to the United States quickly for, for a few minutes. Uh, 2020 will be the next election in the US. Well, Trump, I mean, Trump has promised a lot, maybe in some people's eyes delivered also because there is a job market which is yeah. working yeah. in the United States. The point is wages aren't exactly growing, I think, in the United States. And it's like, it's again, it's like whose GDP is this? I mean, it is. It is. No, the thing is, wages are growing for the okay. first time forever, mm -hmm. mainly because the largest employer in the United States, Walmart, mm -hmm. decided that it needed to start paying a decent wage because going to shop in its stores was like wading through a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. So they raised their uh, their wages, as did a bunch of other large-scale retail employers. Mm -hmm. Plus, the bottom end of the labor market has been picking up as faster than the next two quintiles. So for mm -hmm. once, the growth is going to the worker bees, as they mm -hmm. like to say. Mm -hmm. Now, once you net it out against inflation, is it spectacular growth that's going to transform people's lives? Absolutely not. Oh. Is it doing anything about health care costs? No, they're making it worse with the crusade against Obamacare. Mm -hmm. So in many ways... There's, there have been labor market developments that allow Trump to say, look, things are getting better. Unemployment's at a 33-year low. African-American unemployment is very low. So there's lots of things he can point to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The key thing is, though, that Trump represents a constituency that has absolutely no faith in established elites. Yeah. And they will walk across broken glass to vote for this guy. Mm -hmm. So now you've got impeachment proceedings underway. This is playing right into Trump's hands. Because he knows that he's not going to attract anyone new. It's not as if someone who wasn't a Trump voter three years ago went, you know what, on balance. I thought I think about it. And... <laughs> yeah, that yeah, happened, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. So he's got the people that yeah. voted for him. And he can win if he brings every single one of them out again. Mm -hmm. And impeachment is all about making that base furious and bringing them out and yeah. paralyzing the Democrats because mm -hmm. they're not able to talk about what's wrong and what needs to be done because it'll all be about impeachment. Yeah, the base so, will probably forgive Trump anything anyway oh, absolutely, that he's been accused absolutely. of yeah absolutely uh, he he represents and you know this is where the people who talk about this being essentially a culture war and is more than tinged with racism to be right i mean my friend jonathan kirshner has a great line on this which he says it's absolutely true that every racist that bothered to vote probably voted for ronald trump rather than hillary clinton mm -hmm. it's also absolutely true that everyone who voted for trump is not a racist mm -hmm. absolutely right? so uh, you've got these elements in this mm -hmm. coalition that are um, incentivized only to vote one way. Mm -hmm. And Trump's game has basically motivized all parts of his base, mm -hmm. the ones that care about nationalism, the ones that care about immigration, the ones who care about left behind uh, Midwestern, the ones who care about farmers, the ones who care about conservative values, the mm -hmm. ones who care about abortion. He's got them all on his team. Mm -hmm. The Democrats have yet to decide who their team is. It, should the Democrats run Bernie Sanders? Just hypothetical situation because they do, the the DNC doesn't much seem to like him. But if they would run Sanders, would he would he stand a chance with like an, a left wing alternative which also works for like working people? Well, I haven't looked into the deals of the polls myself, but mm -hmm. the Sanders campaign will tell you that if you do straight matchups, Bernie wins against Trump all the time. Mm -hmm. ah. In so, straight poll matchups, right? So it is conceivable. It was mm -hmm. more than conceivable last time that he would have done it. A mm -hmm. um, kind of dream ticket might be Elizabeth Warren and Sanders, depending mm -hmm. on who gets seniority mm -hmm. yeah. in terms of the Democratic base and mobilization. But then you've got a problem. Your establishment Democrats that like the system as it is, they didn't really see anything wrong with it. They couldn't figure out why these people were all so angry. After all, haven't things been great on Wall Street for the past 20 years? Mm -hmm. The people mm -hmm. with the money... They don't like Bernie at all, and they're deeply suspicious of Warren. Mm -hmm. They would like to have Mayor Pete. They would like to have somebody who's Kamala not really going to change things. Yeah. But that, they're, not, they're a bit slaughtered. Mm -hmm. Your only a, a, a possibility is uh, Biden. And the only reason you're putting Biden up is because it seems to be the case that someone devoid of ideas, who's a 75-year-old white guy who's not racist, mm -hmm. is what you need to defeat Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That seems to be his only virtue. Right. This, I think, falls victim of what we might call the John Kerry trap. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember when Kerry yeah, ran yeah, yeah. against Bush. Yeah. It wasn't because they thought Kerry was the best candidate or he had a great base behind him. It's because they thought that Kerry was the type of person that Republicans might like. 
And why would you base your voting strategy in an incredibly polarized moment mm. on what the other guy wants and pretend yeah. that you're that? It's they, just not credible. Well, if you can't get your own base to come out and vote, this might be the only strategy they can think of right now. Why on earth would African Americans, LGBTQ people, and lots of lefties in the Democratic base get out for Biden? Again, a guy who was a senator for Delaware a place that made tax dodging into an art form to the mm -hmm. point that Holland would blush. Mm. I have one last question for you, Mark, because we have two minutes left. You mentioned that you like to debunk uh, awful ideas or myths that are uh, persistent. Yes. Uh, we oft You're a political economist. Adam Smith was also a political economist. Um, he was also Scottish. And also Scottish, so there's lots in common there. We often hear Adam Smith's ideas, I think, being misrepresented. I mean, Adam Smith, did Adam Smith actually say free market solve anything, open, uh, free trade everywhere, no holds barred, no government intervention? Which no, is often... The, the free trade stuff comes later from David Ricardo. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, the major quote is, Ms. Tate, is not from the wealth of nations, it's from the theory of moral sentiments. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher or the candlestick maker that we get our, or the baker, that we get our bread or we get our meat. Mm -hmm. It's because as if the invisible hand of Jupiter guides them by self-interest. Yes, all of which is true. There's no problem with that. Does mm -hmm. that mean that you basically globalize the hell out of everything and give all money to corporations? It's a bit of a jump from that vague quote in the theory of moral sentiments mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. the way to the world that we inhabit today. I think Smith's best quote is the one where he says, why do we do all this? And we do all this not for the money, not for the fame, not for the glory, but to be recognized as being good people by others that we care about. That's the bit of Smith we should remember. Now, which is also still a little bit of moralizing, but it's an excellent way of... Uh ending the conversation, I think. Mark, thank you very much. It was most interesting. Absolutely. Our All pleasure. Thank you.